In this video, we're going to look at uh, the various cut settings in Lightburn and how to use them to accomplish various things. There's some misinformation out there uh, regarding various cut settings. You'll hear terms like vector engraving, image engraving, marking, cutting. They're all just different ways of controlling the power to the beam of your laser uh, cutting is pretty obvious. Cutting, if this is the material that, like, side view of your wood, for example, cutting is basically firing the laser strong enough to cut all the way through it. Um, it's pretty forgiving. If you overpower it, you set the laser power too high, it doesn't really matter. You'll burn your edges a little bit, but it's not that big a deal. It doesn't require a lot of finesse. Cutting is pretty straightforward, and it's very obvious when you've done it wrong. Uh, if you don't cut all the way through, you can run another pass. That'll usually fix it. Engraving is one of those things where you'll hear a bunch of different terms. So we'll try to break those down. Engraving and marking are essentially the same thing. Marking is cutting only partway into the surface of the material. Engraving is the same thing. You'll hear two different kinds of engraving. One is called image engraving. One is called vector engraving. They are both doing basically the same thing. However, vector engraving is using a shape. Uh, for example, if I make a circle or a piece of text, vector engraving would be filling this text by, or this shape, by scanning the laser back and forth. Generally speaking, engraving is done by scanning the laser back and forth across your image, across your vectors, your shapes, whatever they are and applying power where those vectors are, are filled or closed. So if I select these items here and I say I want to scan these, if I preview this, you can see all of these shapes are now filled, uh, except for where this overlaps, and we'll talk about that a little later, but let me remove these. So these are now filled shapes. The red is showing light burn uh, moving between these shapes. Those are just traversal moves. If I turn those off, this is basically what your laser is going to produce. If you zoom in on this, this isn't actually filled. These are lots of tiny little lines. And you can see if I turn on the traversal moves, the laser moves along this line, turns off, jumps to the next line, moves down this way, jumps to the next line, moves down this way, and so on. When it gets down here, jumps across all the way over here to this letter S, jumps down to this shape, so on and so on and so on. This is called scanning, raster scanning, raster engraving, vector engraving. There's a whole bunch of different words for it, and they all mean exactly the same thing. Raster is a term that dates back to the beginning of television. Television uses what's called a raster scanning beam or a raster scan uh, that's the beam that scans across the surface of the television that excites the uh, phosphors on the front of the screen and makes them light up. Um, that's why you'll hear the term raster used to describe this kind of pattern. When firing your laser, it's not really a television anymore, but it's doing basically the same thing. It's scanning back and forth, turning on and off as it goes to cut. Vector engraving is pretty much just this. It's taking a vector shape and moving the laser back and forth across the shape, turning it on and off to engrave or mark the surface of your material. So to do that, you would generally use high speed and low power, low or medium power, and this depends. Um, depending on how fast you're making the laser go, if I crank the speed all the way up to 500 millimeters a second, for example, I might need to turn the power up in order to cut deeply enough for this to really show well. It totally depends on the laser, the power you're using, the ability of your hardware. Um, but generally speaking, faster, moving faster reduces power uh, in the same way that lowering your power reduces power. If you run the same cut at the same power setting but faster, you deposit less heat on the surface of your material. If you run uh, the same power but slower, you deposit more heat on the surface of your material. There's another setting that affects how these things work, um, and that's called interval. This is also referred to as uh, DPI, or lines per inch, dots per inch. Uh, 
interval in this case is how far apart these different scan lines are. So if I bring this back up in the preview, the spacing of these lines, how far apart each of these horizontal lines is, that's my interval. If I take this number and I double it up to 0.2, there are fewer of these vertical line, or sorry, horizontal lines. So if you look at how many there are at the beginning of this T, for example, if I put this number back to where it was and preview that again, you can see there are many, many more of them. If I lower this down to one millimeter interval, so that's one millimeter between those scan lines, now it's pretty obvious there are far fewer of them. This controls the quality of the output. It also affects how much heat is deposited on the material you're cutting. A lower interval setting means the lines are packed closer together. It means you get a more well-defined curved shape. So for example, if you look at this S, if I set this to one millimeter and preview that, if you look at the S, it's very, very coarse. There are only a few lines that are defining the shape of that S. If I drop this down to 0.5, now there are twice as many points defining the curvature of that S. If I drop this down to 0.1 and actually do it, let's try that again, there we go. Many, many, many more lines. They're much closer together, um, much less or a much more overlap between the individual lines. So this plays into the quality of your engraving and this will affect image engraving or vector engraving. It only affects things that are scanned. If I say I want this cut, if I want to do a light surface marking of these shapes, I can use the same speeds and powers as I would use for regular engraving and just say I want this cut. Cut and mark is the same thing. The only, the only difference between them is that one's going to punch all the way through your material and the other one is not. If I just say cut, it's going to run along the outlines of these shapes, not scan fill them. And you can see here if I follow the preview, it's just doing the outlines. There is no difference between cutting and marking for vector objects other than your power settings or your speed, depending on which one you're using to control. Image engraving is different. Image engraving is using a picture to drive the power setting of the beam as it travels over a shape. So I'll bring in an image that I have. So this fox is something that I use to do tests with. So we're going to set this to 100 millimeters high so it fits here. Lightburn automatically sets this as an image cut. You can't change this because it's image engraving, it's not vector engraving. Um, image engraving is handled in very much the same way as vector engraving. Um, it's affected by line interval. Um, you also get a DPI setting here in Lightburn and these two are just different representations of the same number. If I change the interval or the DPI setting, you can see the interval changes and vice versa. If I change the interval, the DPI setting changes. So we'll start with 0.1, which is what we had before here. If I preview this, the preview starts off as being very, very dark. And that's just because it's not easy for me to draw lines of different thicknesses in this preview. If you zoom in though, you can see the details start to show up. So what's happening is in the areas of brighter portions of the picture, the laser is being turned off for longer periods of time than it's turned on, and that produces light areas. Um, and conversely, in dark portions of the picture, the laser is being turned on for longer than it's turned off, and you end up with dark. Pretty straightforward. Um, this is also called dithering. Uh, it's a very common technique. So if you look at the nose here, lots of long lines where it's dark compared to uh, the brighter portions of the face where it's left off for longer periods of time. Changing the interval will affect the quality of the image uh, in the same way that it does with vector engraving. If I change this to 0.2, that's now 127 dots per inch or lines per inch. If I preview this, you can see much less detail 
when you zoom in here, the lines are farther apart and so there's not as much, uh, not as many opportunities to capture shading. If I change this to be, say, 300 or even 400 dpi, run that again, now it's very, very dark and you have to zoom in considerably more. And you can see now there's much more detail in the face. You can very, very clearly see the nostrils here, for example, um, the pupils in the eyes, and so on. Higher DPI generally results in a better quality output image, but there is a limit. Your laser has a beam width, and going smaller than that beam width for your interval by far is not going to affect much. It's not going to get you much better output. Um, you can do it somewhat. For example, if my beam is one-tenth of a millimeter wide, the beam has a circular shape. And so it's not a square. So if I have a square like this that is one-tenth of a millimeter wide, and I put another square next to it one-tenth of a millimeter away, you can see that they butt up nicely against each other. Circles don't work that way. If I take two circles that are one-tenth of a millimeter in diameter and put them next to each other, you can see there's a, lot, a fair bit of area here that's not really covered by those. The power of the beam is focused in the middle and it falls off towards the edges. So it's actually okay to have a bit of overlap. So if you've got a beam that is one-tenth of a millimeter wide, you can afford to overlap them a little bit and that will gain you something. You can also run the beam slightly out of focus. That sometimes helps with grayscale engraving. There are a whole bunch of tricks that you'll read um, to get various results and various improvements and so on. Um, the one that affects things the most is your interval setting. Um, so play with that. If I, in here, enable overscan, this is something else that affects both vector and image engraving. It's a useful tool. With some lasers, this is handled automatically in hardware. With G-code based lasers, it's not. So let me remove the image. We'll preview this with scan enabled. If I turn on traversal moves here, so you can see the laser path itself. So in this case, the laser is going to start here, move here, turn off right there, jump over to this, and reverse direction and turn on pretty much at the same time. And the laser doesn't move instantly. It has to speed up and slow down. So when it gets to this point, it's reversing direction. It slowly speeds up with the power on, travels along this line, starts to slow down again before it gets to the end here, jumps down to the next line, reverses direction, and so on. What ends up happening is in systems that don't have very great power control is you get overburn on these edges where you're changing direction. So particularly down here where these direction changes are like 90 degrees, the laser hits here, has to stop dead, move down, start up again. You'll end up with burn on these ends. The way to stop that is with the overscan setting. If I turn on overscanning, um, I have my Ruida set. My Ruida does this in hardware, so let me uh, flip. Okay, so I basically just changed which laser I'm using in Lightburn. Try to ignore that for a moment. My Ruida laser does overscan in hardware. It's not a setting I'm allowed to use with that laser. With a G-code laser, However, it doesn't do that in hardware, so you get a setting here called overscan. If you turn this on, if I preview now, you can see these red lines here showing the traversal moves actually shoot out past the ends of my cuts. So what's happening is Lightburn is telling the laser to keep going past the end of your shape and then turn around out here start going back up again, ramp up to speed in this region, and basically the idea is that the laser head is already up and running and moving by the time it gets back to your shape and the beam turns on. 
And so it's not hovering over this area for an extended period of time while speeding up with the laser on, and therefore you don't get a concentrated burn on these edges. If you have a G-code based laser, use overscanning for pretty much everything, it, uh, for engraving at least. It makes a big difference. It really does result in much cleaner edges. It also works the same when you're doing image engraving. If you have a picture, you can enable overscanning for picture engraving as well. And if I preview this, you can see on these edges, the laser is doing exactly the same thing. It's going past the last dots of the image, it goes well past the end here, turn, changes direction out here, turns around and goes back the other way. Overscanning is a percentage of your speed. It defaults to 2.5%. You can change that number if you find that that's not enough or if it's too much. Overscanning also affects how much working area you have. If I park this image right here at my origin, for example, in a normal laser without overscan, this is okay. The laser is just going to scan back and forth and stop right at the edge of this image. If you have overscan enabled, however, what ends up happening is the laser moves past the image, turns around, and moves back. You may bump into your limits uh, if you use overscan really close to the edges of your frame like this, so be aware of that. There are also different methods to use for image engraving. The one that you've seen so far here is called dithering. Uh, we'll just look at that. So dither is the default option. It's generally the best general use option. If I turn off traversal moves and zoom in, it's pretty obvious what dithering is doing. It's just turning the laser off and on rapidly to get you shading. There's no grayscales here. It's just on and off. It's binary. It's uh, packing dots tightly together so that if you move back far enough away from the monitor or from the, the resulting burn, it looks like a picture. This kind of dithering, which is uh, called error diffusion dithering, works really well for photographs and continuous tone pictures. It does not work well for cartoon-like images. So, for example, if I bring in this picture and I use the same setting with this image, you can see these tendrils, or strange wavy lines in the picture. What's happening is the software remembers how wrong I was. Um, basically, I only have black and white uh, on or off to use to generate the shading in this picture. Um, it picks one that's closest to the original color tone of the image, and it remembers how wrong it was, and it takes a small amount of that error, and it shifts it in the directions away from that dot. And so what ends up happening is these little lines here are just that error being shuffled further and further along because there's nowhere for it to go. This image has a pure white background. Pure white is perfect, uh, same as black. And so it's not wrong. So it gets a little bit wrong at the beginning here, and then it's just perfect all the way through, and so there's nowhere for that error to go, and so it just ends up dropping random little dots along the picture. The way to combat this is to use uh, one of the other methods of shading. So there's ordered. Ordered is a more regular patterned shade. Um, you can see that here. This is uh, also called halftone shading. Um, but it's most commonly referred to as ordered dithering. It's uh, a simple pattern that gets applied, and so you can see that here. Um, this is not subject to the same kinds of problems that uh, diffusion dithering is, but it doesn't work as well for continuous tone pictures. Uh, you also have the option to do straight thresholding, which is just um, one or the other, depending on which one's closer. For one-bit images, just black and white images, uh, literally with no shading, this is actually a, a decent option. For most other things, it's terrible, so it's generally not used. If you dither something outside of Lightburn, for example, if you have Photograv or you have other dithering software that produces a one-bit image, you will probably want to use the threshold option here and match the 
uh, size and DPI setting of whatever the picture is that you brought in, and that will give you the least amount of processing on that image. The last option is grayscale. Grayscale is harder to use, but ultimately gives you the best shading. If you look at this with threshold, it's terrible. If I change this to ordered, it's a little better. Still not great. If I change that to dithered, it's better still, but it's still not a true grayscale image. If I do grayscale engraving, and I tell this to shade according to power, this is actually what's going to be output to the laser. You can see these lines are varying in power, and that variation in power is what's creating the shading. This is the best option for photorealistic shading that you have, but it's also the hardest to work with. It's requires a lot of trial and error to get right because different materials burn at different rates, they darken at different rates. It is not simple to make this work, however the results can be well worth it, so you are encouraged to try it. Um, again, the same other caveats apply. Changing the interval or the DPI setting will help. Um, Overscanning also works well with grayscale um, you can also increase the number of passes here. Um, often, grayscale engraving works best when you go slow and with low power. So, uh, setting, for example, of 70 millimeters a second with an overall power of 10 or 11 percent, maybe, um, and then do more than one pass, and each subsequent pass will get a little bit darker. Um, again, trial and error is key here with grayscale. Grayscale is a pain. There are other options as well. Um, with in image engraving, you can change the scan angle. So you can see um, I'm just changing the scan pattern here by moving the angle number. Um, this will allow you to scan vertically, scan at an angle. Uh, some people find that with diode lasers, for example, scanning at an angle helps eliminate or reduce the effects of the uh, oval shape of the beam. Um, your mileage may vary, play with different things. With vector engraving, you also have um, a mode called crosshatch, which I really like. Um, crosshatch basically does a double scan. So it goes one way, then goes the other way. And you can do the same scan angle changes with that one. Um, and crosshatch can actually give you some cool results if you use a large interval. So if I set this to one millimeter, and preview this. The crosshatch pattern is kind of an interesting fill. Um, it's a way of getting a filled shape or something that looks filled but isn't necessarily going to cost you nearly as much time as a full uh, vector engrave. Um, so it's uh, stylized. Um, you can set that fairly high. You can also use what's called scan plus cut this basically does a scan over a shape um, with crosshatch or without, and then runs around the outline with the settings that you see below. So you get both scan uh, speed and power settings, and you get cut speed and power settings, the same way you do with a regular cut. Um, this, if you watch the preview, does the normal raster scan of a shape and then runs the outline. So it's useful for things where you want to do an engrave and then highlight the edge or accent, accent the edge, um, and you don't have to use two separate cutting paths to do it. It's a useful trick.